trade publications. So most of my semesters are spent teaching students how to do what we're going to see tonight, um, minimize so that it works on the most effective thing possible. So it's just great to actually see art for art's sake instead of art for um, the sake of there's a return on investment and we need to sell a thousand copies of this um, and it needs to be a cookbook. So <laughs> I'm so happy that it's something unique. So I want to remind everybody, I want to first thank you for coming to the exhibit. I've seen a lot of your faces um, and see the wonderful art. This is the second year we've done this, and I want to thank the MLA. I know there's they're at the meeting tonight, there's a big uh, MLA uh, event tonight, but I want to thank them publicly for their support. They've actually taken good care of the students and have given the students the ability to have tags and, and, and attend, and also the artists to be able to come to the events. And also, I want to thank all of you for, for coming to the exhibit, and I'd like to see you come tomorrow as well. We close at 7, and we will not be open on Sunday. This is the second year that we've done this event, and it was so successful last year that the MLA did provide us back. So I'm hoping that we have a continued relationship with this organization. I think this is the future for the digital humanities in terms of literature. And I think this, this, this art that you, if you've not seen this art before, this is the first experience for you, you're going to see what has been lighting our fires for a very long time. So thank you. Well, without any further ado, I'd like to introduce tonight our first reader. Uh, our first reader um, modestly suggests that he only wishes to be introduced as an ELIT author. He's a long time and very distinguished and prize winning ELIT author, Alan Bigelow. Thanks a lot, Kathy. I actually said it was okay to mention my name, so that's uh, <laughs> um, Is this sound all right? Uh, okay, cool. Um, I can't resist, I have only a certain of that few minutes here. Um, but I, I just can't resist. Uh, I don't know, some of you may be aware that there's actually an old fashioned safe in the back of this uh, beer. <laughs> and uh, before, about one hour ago, I went with a couple of other people back there and, and I said, oh, this would be a great place to do some videotaping. So I gave my iPhone to someone. And uh, who, who's that, by the way? Jason. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, so I said, oh, well, take the videotape me inside. So I you know, pulled the iron doors closed inside the safe. And I said, oh, and we discussed how I should not lock it because I, I'm claustrophobic and it's a safe after all. Uh, so I, so we started the video and I started, you know, acting, pantomiming, you know. And then I forcefully put, accidentally pushed over and locked myself in the safe. <laughs> And I have to confess, and I think the video will probably bear me out in this, but I can't. <laughs> <laughs> and because uh, I am truly claustrophobic. And, um, and then I immediately started calling for help. <laughs> I'm sure it's, it's shameful. I just spread it. I'm, 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 I'm actually surprised it's not on Facebook already. Uh, and, uh, but he did run away to get help. And then he came back and he continued videotape when he came back, and so I do appreciate that. Uh, and so, but finally, after you know, I really was panicking, and then I figured out that actually you can, by squeezing in the mechanism, you can actually pull, pull the, the gate open, and it came out, and I, I immediately hugged the first person I could find. I think that's also a videotape. <laughs> uh, the point I'm trying to make, of course, is that after that experience for me, everything else is gravy. The life is beautiful. I don't, it didn't matter to me what happened after that. Um, this is a new piece I'm going to be reading tonight. So it's brand new, and actually, it's something that I haven't really uh, developed for performance. And so, I'm actually going to read it the way, same way you read it on, on the internet on a screen. It, it's not Flash. I stopped doing Flash about two years ago. Uh, so, this is, you know, you can read it. I could actually perform it off of my iPhone if I wanted to, but it's hard to read an iPhone, so it's easier off the iPad. Um, and so, I'll just start it off right now. How they brought the news from paradise. An epic poem, but short. I was at the paradise bar, the grass hut on wooden stilts. Its leafy canopy shaded me from the sun to the shallow end of the pool. Floating on my back, I stared up at a mural of Adam and Eve above the bar. The world, a fine place to be. A cornucopia of all, my vacation before me, the lazy sweetness of days stretching into infinity. 
And the Paradise Bar in the St. Regis Hotel, pride of the Caribbean and head of its class, is where I first heard terrible news. A whisper warning at first from Dave the bartender, a tree of life stenciled on his shirt. Then down the bar, a waitress's angry hiss, we're out of rum. <laughs> out of rum? This could not be so. In the best resort of the Caribbean, the best rooms, the best service, the top of the line. And I, an innocent tourist, a witness to the crime. No bum. For true dreamers, there is no better dose to calm your nerves, which I could have used to feel blow up in a tower, or still your fear or hold your passions close. In time to stress, or when the good in life is hard to see, give me a zombie or a pink lady or a Long Island iced tea. No, this last, this tragedy could not stand. On the island of Barbados, so far from Patterson, New Jersey, my distant homeland. Call it four. Call it a sacrifice. But at that moment, a higher claim came to mind, a religious calling almost divine. I would bring the news. I would swim from the paradise to the resort's three interconnected pools to the waiter station at the end. The concierge was always there, walking, talking in hand, dispensing sage advice and quick, imperious commands. He would hear the news when I came down and save us from our terrible fate, or I would drown. Now, the hero. I raise my hand to the other dangling in the water. David, I will go, I cried. I will bring the news. Not waiting for his reply, was that a startled look he gave me? Did the waitress laugh behind my back? I turned and swam to the deeper end. Through dip and turn, past the cascading waterfalls and ivy covered ferns, past sunbathers basking in the sun, toward the next pool, the pirate's cove. But about my wife. My wife of 20 years, my companion through thick and thin, more thin and thick, judging by the recent gravy, but settled into a steady marriage, a daily measure, although the gravy, as I said, was a little more than weight. She waited for road snuggle, the romance novel, and her anxiety bills, longing for imaginary heroes, true lovers, surviving the great divide in the push and pull of life's restless time. More on her later. The Paradise Bar was a distant scrum of heart while overhead the sun of a burning lens burnt my head. As tourists' sandaled feet shuffled by, their murmuring voices a pleasant buzz. A tickle of the good life, foie gras, holidays and nice, lobster, thermidor, champagne and crystal glasses and fancy cigars and humidor. I swam, and up ahead I saw the Pirate's Cove, a wrecked ship, its wood stern and polished hulls jutting from the water. A skull and crossbones fluttered over a long wooden plank, the bar, with its beer taps, shot glasses, and alcoholic bags. Is rum so important, I thought? Am I so selfish as to fill my cup where so many others have run dry? Ahoy, I cried, and slammed away empty glass of the plank. A pina colada, please. Was this my fourth or fifth? The bartender mixed the brew, added a pineapple wedge and a pink umbrella. He split the glass, oh so prettily, his anger shaped ice ever so bittery into my waiting hand. You know they're out of rum in paradise, I said. That's bad. The guard bartender replied, adjusting the black patch on his eye. I would send some up, but we're low here, too. Pirate, low on rum, I thought. What charade is this? What senseless dent in the old mythologies? He rang the ship's bell, not for tips, none of the loud in this five-star resort, not with the prepaid plan, but a call to other pirates. 
Come quick. Come see this human crab who pretends to know himself. See his wrinkled skin. See him in his knobby shell. Pity the poor crab who calls himself a man. His scuttling race is over before his race began. I took my drink and fled, my legs churning in the water the heat of shame along my neck. My news, no news at all, what tourists like me have the right to speak in a pirate's wreck? I swam past the hot tub of a towel dispensary, down a narrow channel of racing water into a gushing plastic artery. My God, my pina colada! I drank it down before the sluice swept me off my feet and tumbled me empty-handed into the foggy deep. I saw the sun, a distant sparkle, its rays reflected by a plastic seaweed floating on the water. Silence took off, and in the milky blue, a mermaid sang with romance, glasses of prosecco, and love's lover's walks. My wife lying to her books, no children we both decided, but no babies underfoot. What of our weary vows, the mermaid asked, the tedious banal, the opportunities in life we missed, had our love been only a stolen kiss. I broke the surface, took a deep breath, and saw the mermaid Herself, a, a life-size plastic model, a mechanical thing with pouty red lips, her tangled golden hair streaming over her fingertips, her plastic tail beat like a feeble heart against the pool's marble edge. The bar's name, the Ocean Grotto, was inlaid in muscle shells on the wall above the mermaid's head. The bartender was a blonde in a mermaid's tail and wearing a diver's belt. A brass monkey, I said. The barmaid's tail splashed. If only my wife had a tail like that. And she missed my drink and added a tiny plastic mermaid on a swizzle stick. By the way, I said, I had learned my lesson and made myself appear in place a tourist with voting rights in this working space. Did you hear the news? What's that? She said. She pulled a knife from her diver's belt and sliced a line in half. They're out of rum in paradise. Ah, she said, like ah with yes or no. They're desperate at it. There's going to be a riot. As she cut the line, I saw her toes poking from the plastic tail, the brown roots in her hair. Her disguise was torn away. She did not care. I downed my drink and gave her the empty glass. She took it without seeing me. A man with a paunch, a ridiculous thirst, and thinning hair. Yeah. My stroke was heavy as I swung away, the sun of a bloody dawn on the horizon. The next bar was closed. What comedy was this? The golden moon's dark and hidden under a park uh, plastic top. I went on in shallow water now, the sharp pebbles under my feet. Past the pool chairs stacked against the wall, past the laundry room and the towel boy's empty seat. The pool thinned to a narrow corridor where the sun was lost, my path in shadow, as I sloshed past the sh shut and bolted doors. I bumped against an iron grate. Behind it, a filter pump wheezed and gasped as it sucked in the pool water, dealt it a clean the grave was locked, no waiter stationed here, no concierge at the helm, just me at the pump for the water's gurgling flow. Too late, I envy my wife, saved her romantic tales, where love is a constant comfort, reliable as the daily mail, where couples know their parts and don't pretend, and give thanks for who they are, and share their lives, love without regret, a love driven by human ties. Now I knew, for me, the path was lost. The news had not been told. The rum had run out, and I was the last to know. Thanks very much.